Okay, the clock is not wrong. That was a fast 10 or 12 minutes right there. Okay, everybody, let's start up so we can finish up. And uh, okay, preaching with power is our next subject to finish off the night. <laughs> preaching with power or power preaching. Wait a second. Wait a second. Power evangelism. What is power evangelism? Preaching with power. We preach with power. We preach with power based on the authority we have been given by God as proclaimers of the word. I'll repeat that. So the title of our last part of our class is Preaching with Power. And the subtitle is, We Preach with Power Based on the, that's a Baltimore on, by the way, uh, based on the authority we have been given by God as proclaimers of the word. We preach with power based on the authority we have been given by God as proclaimers of the word. Number one, um, power, power, right? Power is a big word. Power, what does that mean, to have power? Well, it's, it means that there's energy for one thing, it means that there's something there more than the word itself, okay? More than the word itself. There's something behind the words or there's something in the words. And of course, we know what is in the words is the life of God, is God himself. So the first point of preaching with power is that words have power. Words have power. Um, language in the old times, uh, ancient languages, language um, actually it was an instrument of power to, to, to have languages like that. As a matter of fact, just the blessing, you know, when you speak about like ancient things, you think of, you know, curses, right? Witches, curses, uh, pagan religions. So the words that had power oftentimes for for pagans, were not words of blessing, but words of curses. And actually, many of the curses came from their gods, okay? From their ancient gods. They, they would curse you uh, for certain things. And so, to them, they were very fearful of that curse. Very fearful of words that would come from a god, or that would be proclaimed by someone who represented a god, okay? The Egyptians had this. Um, every ancient religion had this type of cursing. As a matter of fact, um, we see a lot of it written about in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Um, but also a blessing carries power, okay? A blessing. And it speaks many times in the Bible of how the Christian and the preacher, the proclaimer of God's truth, has also the power to bless. So there actually is something about words. Words are just not empty. Words do have power. We know that, right? Martin Luther King's speech, his I Have a Dream speech, right? Isn't, there, isn't it more than words? Isn't there, there's more than words. There's power in those words. And those words live beyond the one who said the words. Now, they are not the word of God, but there is power nonetheless in those words. If there's power in those words, how much more power in words that are eternal? Words that come from the living God. Words that live, essentially. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? That's the type of power that we're talking about, a power to create. And so... There is power in words. And because there's power in words, and the preacher is one who gives the word of God, then the preacher has power in his preaching. Because of the type of words that he is speaking, those words have actual power. And so <clears throat> what I want to look at is Numbers chapter 22 and verse 15. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, whether you like it or not, 
You could be a King James only guy, but it's okay. I am too. Except tonight we're going to read on a few of these verses. I want to um, just make it a little easier to understand. Uh, New Living Translation, Numbers 22, 15 through 17. Speaking about Balak, who was Balak? Balak was one of the enemies of Israel. Um, and Balak, he tried to hire someone named Balaam. And what did he want Balaam to do? Anybody? He wanted to speak, have him speak some words. Hey, hey Balaam, say some words. Um, I like Mickey D's. You know, whatever. You know, no, we're not talking about empty words. They wanted him to say some words of cursing, some words that would have an effect on this little nation or this new nation of Israel. Then Balak, in verse 15, tried again. This time he sent a larger number of even more distinguished officials than those he had sent the first time. They went to Balaam and delivered a message to him. This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Please, don't let anything stop you from coming to help me. I will pay you very well to do whatever you tell me. Just come and curse these people for me. <laughs> What a job, right? Yeah, just say a few words, right? Balak wasn't looking for Balaam just to come, you know, and say a curse like your mother wears army boots, right? That was a, that was a favorite one, you know, um, probably before I was around. but Or to swear at them, you know, call them a name. That's, that's the kind of cursing that we think about. In French, it's maudit, right? To, to curse someone. But um, it wasn't that. Um, Balak believed, and so did the people, and so did the Israelites. Believed that, and so did God, by the way. Believed that the, the words of Balaam had power to bless and to curse. So later in Numbers um, 23, um, Balaam, the, the king, king, then King Balak said to him, come with me to another place. There you will see another part of the nation of Israel, but not all of them. Curse at least them, at least that many. So Balak took Balaam to the plateau of Zophim on Pisgah Peak. He built seven altars there and offered a young bull and a ram on each altar. Then Balaam said to the king, Stand here by your burnt offerings while I go over there to meet the Lord. And the Lord met Balaam and gave him a message. Then he said, go back to Balak and give him my message. So Balaam returned and found the king standing beside his burnt offering with all the officials of Moab. What did the Lord say? Balak asked eagerly. This was the message Balaam delivered. Rise up, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. He... Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, I received a commandment to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. No misfortune is in the, his plan for Jacob. No trouble is in store for Israel, for the Lord their God is with them. He has been proclaimed their king. God brought them out of Egypt. For them he is... A strong A is a wild ox. No curse can touch Jacob. No magic has any power against Israel. For now, it will be said of Jacob, what wonders God has done for Israel. These people rise up like lionesses, like a majestic lion rousing itself. They refuse to rest until they have feasted on prey, drinking the blood and the slaughtered. <laughs> then Balak said to Balaam, fine. But if you don't curse them, at least don't bless them. But Balaam replied to Balak, Didn't I tell you that I can only do what God, what the Lord tells me? Isn't that interesting? We think about that. Balaam was hired by people to say words. He was hired by them to say words. Words of blessing or words of cursing. And the people believed that those words had power because, in fact, they did in some way. They had, he had the power to bless. Pagans, um, 
they did use curse words, but mostly to curse. God no longer, God doesn't allow Christians to curse, does he? No, I mean, we're not supposed to curse. Like, curse, we're not supposed to swear words. I'm not talking about swear words. I'm talking about cursing. Like, I wish you were dead. You know, and the fire, you know, like uh, John and, John and um, James, Jesus. Would you like us to call fire down from heaven, you know, and burn up these Samaritans? And Jesus said, no. No, no more cursing. No more cursing. Only God can curse at this point. Um, believers cannot c- curse. It's reserved to God. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 14, it says this. It says, bless them who persecute you. P- persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Hachoo! God bless you. Right? That's not what we're talking about. Those are meaningless, absolutely meaningless words. They mean nothing. We're not talking, that's just, what are you talking about? A blessing is something where the preacher, where the man of God puts forth a word of blessing. You don't even have to close your eyes. It's not just a prayer at the end of a service. It's a blessing or a benediction where you command that demons stay away from your people, where you command that your people be protected by angels, that you command through the power of the authority of God to bless, to bless. God allows us to bless, even to bless those who persecute. He commands us to bless. Bless those who persecute you. Don't, how much better would the world be if people were blessing rather than cursing? How much better would our Christian life be if we were blessing our enemies rather than cursing our enemies? If we were wishing them well rather than wishing them hurt? So much better. And so this is interesting, isn't it? Literally, in the Bible, they're talking about the power of this man, this evil man, Balaam somehow had the power. He had power to use words to create things, to hurt people with just words. So you think about that. We have the word of God, of the living God, and we can use that word to bless people. How much more powerful is that? How many lives can we change? What can we do with our little time that we have on earth to bless to create, if you will. Number two, um, number one was what? Words have power, right? Um, Words have power. Number two is words create reality. Words create reality. Genesis chapter one and verse three, then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. How about that? God said, let there be light, and there was light. I mean, that's pretty simple, right? Words create a reality that wasn't there before. When God speaks, things happen. God spoke to nothing. And nothing heard his voice and became something. Have you ever heard that? God spoke to nothing. Nothing heard his voice and became something. That's what happened here. See? Peter spoke a word. And what happened? Something that wasn't there was then there because he blessed. We speak words, and we create new realities for people. We create new realities for ourselves. We create, the Bible says that we can save a soul. That we can save a soul. How is that possible? Because we carry the words of life. We carry God's presence with us. It is so amazing. It is like like we have a badge on us of authority, a badge that says you can do stuff that you never thought you could do. You can do stuff. You can do stuff 
that you never thought you could do for God. You can create a new reality through the word of God. I'm not talking about some euphemistic reality, some feel-good kind of thing where we're all kind of together and hugging and everything like that. No, you can change the world. You can see people that were going to hell go to heaven. You can see orphanages set up. You could see things that will happen because God's power made them happen through a person who believed the very words that God said. So if we believe what we're saying, it's amazing what can happen. It's amazing, and I don't even know how it works. And it doesn't seem to work sometimes, but I really and truly believe that sometimes it's not that things don't work, and it's not that the Word of God doesn't work, it is that the Word of God is working. And that God has an individual plan for all of us. But I see things happen. I see in little ways, in little corners of people's lives, where people are being changed right now before our very eyes. When Pastor Stan and his wonderful wife, right there in the back, whose house I stayed in, the Collinses, you know? What was, what was in Peru when they went there? There was a lot of Peruvians. And there were a lot of churches, but there was no Greater Grace Church. There was no Bible college. There were no three and four churches in Lima that were preaching the Word of God the way that they preached the Word of God. There wasn't outreaches into Chile. There weren't outreaches into Argentina. But now there is, because there was a new reality that happened because the Word of God was put forth. So you have Karen and Pastor Stan going forth with the Word of God preaching, doing Bible studies, soul winning, faithful, faithful, faithful. It happens. It happens in Korea. It happens in Thailand. It happens all over the world where there was nothing. Now there's something because somebody believed the words that they were speaking came from God. And so that's what we're dealing with right now. It is an awesome reality. It is a reality that's only created when we speak the words of God by faith. God spoke to nothing, and, no, and nothing heard its voice and became something. That's what happens. Those are words to live by right there. Um, the Bible says in Hebrews 1.3 that God upholds all things by the power of his word. In Hebrews 11, chapter 17, it says that by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, uh, who uh, had received the promises offered up in his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac shall your seed be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from which also received him in a figurative sense. It's interesting how Abraham believed God's word had power. He believed, before he could see it, he believed it, and it happened. Um, now we know also, uh, in terms of the word creating reality, that the word became flesh. It says in John 1.14 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the words and the, the description of words in the Old Testament, it's not just syllables and letters, but the word is like an event. There's something behind the words. Words are powerful. Um, Christ, in this case, is the word, and he is the event. He is the word, and he is the event. And so um, things change. Things change. Uh, the, word, the word creates a new reality also. For, uh, for sinners. Look at, look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 that you know. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? you no, is what he's saying. You are our epistle, written in the hearts and known and read by men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. What is Paul saying to the people in Corinth? He's saying that you are the living Word of God. We can see it. We can read it on you. You've changed us. 
You've changed the lives of other people. You've created new realities for sinners. Um, you've, trans, you've been transformed into something. You are something now that you were not before. It creates and it recreates. It creates and it recreates. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Behold, all things become new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, then the verse that Pastor Dan said in um, 2 Corinthians 5.20, now we are ambassadors for Christ. It's a new reality. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, that's a new reality, isn't it? That's a new reality that the Word created. That my, my righteousness is, uh, it's as filthy rags, right? That's what my righteousness is. It's garbage. It's nothing. To, it stinks. It's the stinky God. You know, that's what my righteousness is. But the Word created a new reality. And now the new reality is that my righteousness is Christ's righteousness. Is that his righteousness is mine. And mine is his, that we are one. It's amazing. It is the power of the word. It's an event that took place. Number three, words are events. Words create reality. There's power in words. Words create reality. And number three, words are events. Words are things that happen. There is this uh, explanation, and I'm going to read it to you and see if it makes any sense. It's the word for word in the Old Testament is debar, D-A-B-A-R. And... Um, I have verified this from three sources today. Uh, the word debar means word or talk in Hebrew. Um, it occurs in various texts in the Hebrew Bible. It's like um, a combination, in a sense, of logos and um, uh, uh, rhema, yeah. Uh, but it occurs in, in the Hebrew. Um, it's used in reference to the divine word, but it's also used in the sense of an of a word event or a prophetic deed. Um, in Christianity, I'm going to read now, the Old Testament concept of the word event, represented by Debar, carries over to the New Testament where revelation can be seen as events explained by words. Hence, in the New Testament, the word Debar continues to be more than a mere sound. So it's not just a sound, it's not just syllables, it's not just a doctrine, but it refers to people and actions reaching its climax in the incarnation of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Words that make things happen. Words that are events in and of themselves. Words are events. Yes. That, 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 that quote? Sure. In the Hebrew, debar is something used in reference to the divine word. And in an active sense, as a word event or prophetic words. In Christianity, the Old Testament concept of word event represented by Debar carries over to the New Testament where revelation can be seen as events explained by words. Hence, in the New Testament, the word debar continues to be more than a mere sound or a doctrine, but refers to people and actions reaching its climax in the incarnation of Jesus. And then I said that words are events and they make things happen. Words inspire. Words heal. Words comfort. Words exhort. Words correct. Words change stuff. Or you could say things like I wrote, but they do. Words change things. 
And then God's word, once again, spoken through the church, changes the world. Uh, Romans 4.17, it says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be as though they were not. I'm sorry, be not as though they were. Sorry, I got that mixed up. It's an event. It calls things that are not as though they were. Okay, we are sinners. We have a death sentence on us. We are unredeemable in our flesh. Yet God says we are redeemable. He calls that which was not as though it were, and because he did, it is. Right? Because he did, it is. Because he said the word, it is. God spoke to nothing. Nothing heard his voice and became something. Isn't that something? Um, Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. It was an event. The word of God created an event. Abraham and Sarah were too old to have children, but God promised that they would. So God made something that was not to be. He made it happen through his word. His word was powerful. His word was creative. His word was an event. Uh, because the word creates, because the word creates all by itself, we as teachers and preachers, we don't need to manipulate the word to make it do something that it's not meant to do. We just preach the word and let God do the work. Why do I want to get exhausted trying to make things happen through the word? Just preach the word. Wherever you are, just preach the word faithfully. The word will do the work of God. The word of God does the work of God every time. Every time. We don't have to manipulate it. We don't have to try. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but the water, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, so it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Something's going to happen when the word of God is preached. And it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Faith, salvation, forgiveness, positional truth, restoration, hope, love. All these things come through preaching the word. Um, two more points and then we'll close. Uh, the words bring dead things to life. <laughs> Isn't that something? Words, the word of God brings dead things to life. In John chapter 5, Jesus is prophesying. He says in 528, he says, An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs, what does it say, will be resurrected? No, will hear his voice. They will hear his word. He's going to bring them back to life. The word is going to bring them back to life. What did Jesus say in John eleven forty three? He said simply this, Lazarus, come forth. Does anybody remember what happened after that? He came forth. See, words brought life from death. Our words bring life from death. Our words bring life from death. Um, 
Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, you who were once dead in your sins are made alive through Christ. The words bring life. They, they create life. And finally, and to close the class, the word of God is alive. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, for the word of God is quick. Oh, it's al we're almost done. I do have a few more things. Sorry about that. I've got other notes on my iPad. I'm going to kill you guys, really. Um, it says, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, um, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the word of God is alive. It is powerful. It is quick. It is sharp. It's piercing. It's dividing. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of men. See? See what happens when we preach? It's not that we're judging people. It's not that we're pointing fingers at people. We don't have to. We don't have to. We don't even know what we're saying half the time. People, how many times have people come up to you and they say, I can't believe you, you said that. How did you know that? Or you have no idea, but this is what was happening in my life. And then you preach that message and now I'm set free, or, or now I'm not set free. Now I'm leaving the church, whatever, I don't know. Now, you know, somehow though, you, God knew, because his word is alive in you. Not the written word, not the written word, not the written word, the spoken word, the preached, the taught word, it's alive. It's proclaimed. It does an amazing work in our lives. It is active. We need to have a living faith, an active faith. Uh, we need to have faith in the message that we preach. If we don't, we should just sit down as preachers, as teachers. If we don't believe what we're saying, we should take a break. We should sit down and just listen instead of preaching. You know, you've all heard Pastor Shabelli say how, you know, he, when he's preaching, he's the best preacher in the world. And he is, because he's preaching. He's the one that's called to preach at that time. And the audience that he's with are the people that he's meant to preach to. God is speaking through him to them. So he is the best preacher. He absolutely is. But if we have no faith in our message, then we'll have no power in our pulpits. Um, okay. Okay. Two more points. I'm sorry, I forgot about these notes. Um, yes, yes. Your points, uh, words are events. Is that a sub point? Yes, then? words are events is a sub point. That's number three. Sorry. Words create reality is number two, I think. Yes. Words are events is number three. That's number three. Yep. And then four, four is words, words bring, bring dead, things dead, to life. dead things to life. Number five is the word of God is alive. Okay. okay. We get a title of the next, so I'm sorry, uh, we have more. But this is short. There's only two points. It's called excellence in preaching. Excellence in preaching. Think of that term, excellence. We used to have a saying at Basement Waterproofing Nation, excellence in waterproofing. It's a good saying. If you're going to do it, you should do it right. So this goes a, a little bit away from what we've been talking about most of the class it goes to the point that we, num point number one, we must see the importance of preaching, is what I wrote. Otherwise, we will never have enough time even to prepare. We must be excellent in what we do. It's not saying that we have to have every point, that we have to write out every part of our sermon or anything like that, but there's nothing wrong with writing out our sermon. Actually, it can be quite amazing. And actually, it can make it a lot easier because it defines what we're doing a little bit. Um, not always, but sometimes it's really good. We have a special responsibility when we're called from, uh, by God to preach the word. Okay, this is kind of a recap. We're literally standing in God's place. We are God's mouthpiece for the person that God has chosen to deliver his message to. And we must do with, I'm sorry, um, he's chosen to deliver his message to, and we must do it in a way that honors the Lord, okay? When we're called 
to preach. We've got a responsibility not only to God, but to the person that we're supposed to, or the people that we're supposed to be preaching to. And the more, the better we do it, the more dedicated we are in doing it, the more we prepare. Remember, preparation is power. Preparation is power. It's not that we have to be uptight, you know. It's not that we have to be legalistic. We're not. It's not that we can't have fun. We can. But we need to give the truth of the message of the word. They don't need us, you know. They need God. They need God from us. And then finally, the quality of a preacher's sermon is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence in three things. The quality of a preacher's sermon is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence in three things. You ready? Okay. The quality of a preacher's sermon is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence. Think about the band. Think about the guitar players, the violinists, the flutists, the bass players, the drummers, the guitar players, and all the other instruments that are up there, the singers. They actually practice quite a bit, even though they're working, but they're committed to excellence. So they spend time making what they do excellent. And we appreciate it, don't we? Well, God appreciates when the preacher or the teacher, when, when their sermon is done in that way. The quality of a preacher's sermon is in direct proportion to their commitment to three things. Excellence in prayer. About the message. About what to speak. What do you want me to speak to people? Excellence in preparation. And I, though we didn't touch on this much, also excellence in presentation. Excellence in prayer, excellence in preparation, and excellence in presentation. I want to be able to say that my message wasn't just rhetoric. You know what I'm talking about when I say that? What, what do I mean when I say that my, I don't want my message just to be rhetoric? You know, what happens to a preacher who's not prepared? Sorry? He mumbles. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. Um, anybody else? Platitudes. Platitudes. Re rhetoric. This is what happens to me, and this is what happens to a lot of people, and they don't even realize what it is. It's not that they're being repetitious. Um, I mean, part of what we do is, is repetition. I mean, that's part of teaching. We repeat all the time, all the time, you know. But, we, you know, but God somehow makes it new. Um, you know, so it's not that we're making the same proclamations over and over again. We are. Um, it's about being lazy, actually. It's about being lazy and unprepared. And what happens when or, or not able to prepare for some reason, but what can happen if we're not careful? is that we fall into kind of a default mode and every message has the same conclusion. Or we fall back, say for example, that Pastor Steve is just loving communion. Everything's about communion. Well, in every message, no matter how he starts, it's always going to end up at the communion table, you know? Or all I want to do is talk about justification. So no matter how my message begins, it always ends with justification because that's where I'm most comfortable. Okay, But it's because my message is not prepared. It's so that I ran out of, I didn't even have a conclusion. My conclusion to uh, whatever it was that I started with, you know, is justification. So, it, you know, I'm just saying as an example. But you know what I'm talking about? That's what happens. It's a natural default that we'll end up with if we're not careful. Any questions about that? Good, because we're almost done. Ah, these are just some things I wrote down. Um, preachers, teachers. 
these are sayings that I've picked up over the years. <laughs> that you can speak for 15 minutes to the congregation, and sometimes it f when you do it feels like an hour, <laughs> you know. But also you can preach for an hour, and if you're prepared, it seems like 15 minutes. If you've got good content. You know, people like to hear what God has to say. They don't necessarily want to hear what you have to say, you know. So you can preach for an hour, and it seems like 15 minutes, but you can also preach for 15 minutes, and it can feel like an hour to people. Um, one of the important things is that we, rather than just studying doctrine, which is very good, we talked about it much earlier with systematic preparation, but it's also good that we just read our Bibles, read through books, read in that way, read the Bible as it flows, because um, we want to let the Bible speak to us. And make sure that you always believe that if you're there, behind the pulpit, behind the podium, wherever it is that you're preaching or, sh or teaching, believe that God wants you there. That God, that is, because you know, that's true. And these are just some tips. <laughs> these are some things that, it's always funny to me, because this happens to Preachers, especially, I th it may be a little bit unique to our church where the pastor just kind of turns to you when you're on the stage uh, very occasionally and might just say, or might call you an hour before on Sunday night and say, can you do a 10-minute message? What do so often people say when they get up there? The pastor just called me. <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> Don't ever say the pastor just called me 10 minutes ago or just called me two hours ago uh, because it just gives you an excuse to fail anyways, you know. Be prepared instead or just say no, you know. But don't throw the pastor under the bus. It doesn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't look good for the pastor. Maybe sometimes it embarrasses them. Um, he only asked me, well, I was up there one time and Pastor Schaller just looks at me, he says, um, do, do you have 10 minutes you know, to preach? I'm like, yeah, I got 10 minutes. Then he looks over to me two minutes later and says, you got a half hour? <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, all right, no problem, whatever you like, Pastor, you know. But we do, I mean, there is a sense where we want to honor the pulpit in that sense, you know. Um, but we should be ready if we're up there to preach. We should be ready to preach. Um, um, a lot of this other stuff I've already said. You know, I do like this idea, though, just in practical sense, is that we should know how we're going to finish our message before we start it. And we should know, once we know how we're going to finish, then we, sh then we should know how we're going to start. We should always preach grace. We should always preach salvation. We should always preach the finished work. And when we preach through books, we should not preach a running commentary. We should find out what God's saying in a particular passage. And then our expository preaching becomes topical preaching within the context of the book, right? We all are topical preachers. You have to be a topical preacher, okay? But topical preaching is attacked because what happens is people bring their topic to the scripture. Remember we talked about that earlier? We don't need to do that. That's a disservice to the word of God. It's a disservice to ourselves and it's a disservice to the congregation. What we need to do is simply discover what the topic is within the passage and preach on that, you know. And there might be two topics, but only pick one, you know, for that particular day if you can. One topic, many points, but you have the main and then you have the branches off the main, basically. So we already talked about not preaching politics. So um, those are just some basic things, you know, as far as the, uh, whether it's an offering or anything like that, it's always good just to act like you're supposed to be there. I remember, this is just personal, but when Pastor Star Schaller started having me speak often was in the 2005 when he became the pastor, right? That makes sense. And um, so, and then uh, a little bit when I traveled with him a couple times. But, um, so I forgot what we were talking about. See, this is what happens. You listen, and I don't even remember what I'm saying. Thank you for listening. 
You know, it, this is kind of a funny thing, but we are all actors to some extent. You know what I mean? We act the part. Fake it till you make it. You know, you get all those kind of things that people say. But I remember specifically when Pastor Stevens, the first time he ever asked me to preach, I was so nervous. But I said to myself, he's the pastor. And if he's the pastor and he wants me to speak, then I must be supposed to speak. So why should I be nervous, right? Now, it didn't take away the nervousness, but it helped, right? And then when he asked me to do something else, and I always felt that way, well, I'm just going to fake it. You know, I'm just going to go up there, and I'm going to act like I'm supposed to be here. Maybe nobody will notice, you know? <laughs> uh, you know? And I remember when Pastor Shabelli first called me and asked me to pr teach on preaching here at the Bible College in 05. I'm like, you know, I, I really felt like, are you sure you have the right number, you know? But they did, and I said, well, if that's the case, then I'm going to do it. I mean, this must be what God wants for me, you know? And it just has been that way in the last, you know, nine or ten years, where it's like, this must be what God wants. So it is what God wants. He wants you to teach this way. He wants you to know that you have his authority. He wants you to know that uh, if people hear you, they're hearing God. You're speaking for him, so act like you're speaking for him. And before you know it, what was once acting is now actually who you are. It's actually who you are. It's interesting, isn't it? It's who we are. We're God's spoke people, spokespeople, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here together. Thank you for this amazing week, at least for me, because I only had to be here for four hours. But for these guys, 36 hours, that's amazing. God bless them. I pray that you protect us. Lord, I ask now for your blessing on the congregation, on the class here. As we leave this evening, I pray for special blessings of driving and safety that you put your angels around your people to protect them bring them home safely and back to wherever they have to go tomorrow and in we make that proclamation and that blessing by the power of your word in the holy spirit in the name of jesus christ amen amen thank you guys